Stop. Stop. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today for another Jaggy Globe presentation. My name's Tom Briggs. I'm a climber and marketing director at Jaggy Globe. And this week I'm very excited to have Becky Coles with us. But first, just a quick reminder that next week we have polar expert Helen Turton talking to us about how to get into the whole world of polar travel. Climber, mountaineering instructor, and expedition leader Becky Coles. Becky was born in Kent. When and when she's at home in the UK, she splits her time between the mountains of Snowdonia and the gritstone edges of the Peak District. Her expedition mountaineering includes personal first ascent expeditions. Climbing the 7,000 meter peak, Peak Lenin in Kyrgyzstan, and traveling overland from Kathmandu to the UK. Last summer, she climbed 56 of the 82 Alpine 4,000 meter summits. May September, she climbed the Peak Mountaineering and Climbing Instructor, and she first worked for Jagged Globe in 2012 and has led half a dozen expeditions for us, as well as being regular on our Scottish winter course. Today, she's going to talk about exploration, exploration. Thank you very much, Tom. I'm just going to put uh, bring you across now, Becky. Hello there, how are you doing? Hi Tom, thank you very much. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm good, thanks. Good. Good, good. I'm getting lots of feedback in my, I don't know if it's my headphones or the connection this morning, but uh, does it sound okay at your end? Uh, it's okay, you broke up a little bit in that introduction, so yeah. hopefully I am um, <laughs> sounding all right. <laughs> yeah, I know you sound totally clear to me. Um, so yeah, we, I was just going to say, the session today is going to be a little bit different from previous talks. Um, so we're going to encourage people to interject with questions as and when they think of them using the Q&A function. Um, and it might be that we, uh, you know, we, we, we throw some of those in as we go along and some of them we might park until till later on. Um, OK, Becky, so what I'm going to do is just rack up your slides over here on the left and then bring them across and then yeah we'll get dive straight in. Great okay well uh, I split the talk up into three sections so uh, those three sections being physical preparation, mental preparation and preparing with your sort of knowledge skills and expectations before you go. Uh, and, and so, yeah, maybe we'll answer a few questions after each of those and then have um, a main question and answer session at the end. So next slide, please, Tom. It's a little bit of a so, delay for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. OK, so I think most people think about uh, expeditions as being very physical and needing to physically prepare and get really fit for them. And uh, definitely the, the fitter you are, the better chance of success you have, the less chance of injury and the more enjoyable your trip will be. But I would say that the other things I'm going to talk about are just as important. So it's very, it's very easy to get quite focused on getting physically fit and neglect the other things. And now I would say this is very non-scientific, but I would say on non-technical peaks, about 25% um, of success rate is from fitness uh, and people being physically prepared. And 25% is mental toughness. 25% is looking after 
yourself and then 25% is down to luck, <laughs> uh, the weather and the conditions and that sort of thing that, that are out of our control. So yeah, so this is kind of 25% um, aspect uh, we have to have to be aware of. And Jaggy Globe do give a lot of information on this. And I'd also signpost you towards um, the uphill athlete stuff, which I believe Jaggy Globe signposts you towards as well, about getting fit for these sorts of mountain trips. And um, if there's one thing that you could sort of take away from this physically, is to combine endurance training with some strength training. And I myself have neglected the strength training a bit in the past and didn't realise how important it was. So I was always pretty good at going out for long days in the hill, which is great for endurance. But um, yeah, actually a bit of gym work, I'm a big believer in now and, and doing that strength training as well. So strength and endurance, focusing on um, predominantly. Yeah, nothing beats long days out on the hill, without a doubt. Um, but you can also do stuff with, within a gym environment as well if you don't have that access to the hills. Uh, so yes, that is, um, that's really important for physical side of things. So yeah, I think just to, just to jump in there, the yeah the uphill athlete website has lots of really good resources and information. I mean, you can sign up to uh, training plans that um, you know designed for uh, mountaineering expeditions. Um, but uh, yeah, I definitely advise people to to sort of ch check that out. And I mean, on, and on the strength thing, I mean, that, I, I always think that's as much about avoiding injury as well as. Um, mm. You, you know, because you have to be so robust, don't you, to, you know, carry a pack and all that? Yeah, without, yeah, without a doubt. And um, you definitely, yeah, don't want to be picking up injuries on a trip because you're not used to those sorts of, um, that sort of physical exercise, you know, that type of physical exercise. So replicating it as much as possible, like walking up steep hills, with a pack on um, means that yeah you can pre can prepare the best you can but yeah I would go beyond that and 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 do specific yeah that specific strength training that can be achieved quite well in in a gym environment. Um, Great. Yeah. Okay, so I would say the other thing apart from physical training that people focus on a lot is kit and um and getting exactly the right kit for a trip and you know i enjoy to buying kit as much as the next person <laughs> but i almost think people can get a bit overly fixated with that and they even spend too much of their time looking at different uh researching kit and that side of things when actually you know th there's potentially better um, use of the time in preparation. But if I was going to say one thing about kit, and that is read the kit list and bring what's on the kit list. <laughs> um, Jaggy Globe has, has had decades worth of experience really with, um, with putting these kit lists together and they're really well thought out. So um, I'll give an example, yeah, boots and, and when to have double boots. Uh, Jackie Globe are very clear on this, as most expedition companies are. And but I'll often get people on trips go, oh, but my mate said that they didn't need double boots when they came away, um, and then they don't have the right kit, um, and that can, can can be sometimes it can be resolved on a trip. Sometimes it's it's a lot more difficult to do. So so yeah, um, you do need the right kit, sure, and it will make your life. Uh, more comfortable but all that detail is in the kit list so adhere to that and um, and you really will be on to, on to a winner there uh, and I've put that sort of um, it's a bit abstract putting it under physical preparation but I guess we physically require these things um, and a lot of people yeah focus on the training focus on the kit buying but I think there's a lot more a lot more to it than that. <laughs> Um, what are your thoughts on 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 kits, Tom? 
Yeah, I mean, it depends <laughs> on the expedition, really. I think it becomes more critical on those expeditions. I'll give you an example would be Denali or Aconcagua even, um, where that where the photo is there. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, where the lightweight nature of the, um, because you're carrying it, um, the kit becomes m more important. You know, it's a choice of, you know, inflatable mattress, um, you know, or th that sort of thing. You know, it all adds up. And nowadays, of course, the kit's so much um, more sophisticated than it was, you know, even 20 years ago. Um, yeah, I I I'd agree. I mean, most of our expeditions, of course, we have some level of support. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's the whole cliche, isn't it? Uh, all the gear, uh, no, no idea. You know, you, it it is an important aspect of preparing for your expedition. Aspects. Yeah, I mean, having the having the adequate kit is is obviously essential, um, and the the kitless side of things um, will prepare you if, adhering to that will mean that you're you're on the right track with that and say familiarity with your kit which is might we might get into um uh, just a bit later on it is of equal importance to having um yeah having bought the right kit <laughs> with you okay so um that is all i wanted to say on physical preparation because i wanted the time to talk about mental preparation and um skills knowledge and expectations uh as well so i don't know if we've got any any burning questions on that side of things yet um otherwise we can just keep them keep them to the end I think, uh, yeah, I think we're all right on the questions just now. I think th th somebody's just saying the sounds bad on. Uh, I think it's me. So, <laughs> so if you if you keep talking, I think you you sound uh, you, you. There's no problem at your end, Becky. So yeah, apologies to people for that. Um, uh, there is one question here about sort of specific training that can help with acclimatization. You know, is there anything you can do that can assist with that? Ask Lane. So regarding acclimatisation, the best thing you can do is be as fit as you can be before you go. But that still might not. Um, uh, altitude is a funny thing and that um, and that might not. It might just be more important in the end of the day to be being walking really slowly and being really steady and really looking after yourself at altitude um, might make a bigger difference than actually being um, super fit. But personally, I cover both bases and be as fit as you can be. Um, if we're kind of edging into the whether pre-acclimatisation is a sensible thing or not, well, I think actually the, the science currently out there is the most important thing is a sensible acclimatization profile. So your itinerary for your trip being a um, uh, having a gradual ascent, basically, uh, which is what all Jagged Globe trips would uh, adhere to. And actually they put <laughs> a lot of effort into making those um, itineraries really uh, really good for acclimatisation and give everyone um, the best chance for for, for acclimatising on the trip. Uh, yeah, cool. Should we go into a bit of mental preparation then before before a trip? Yeah, I think I've already clicked onto that slide, but uh, let, let's go for it. Yeah. So a, a big thing that I well I mentioned at the start, didn't I? That um, I thought actually mental toughness really um, represented maybe about 25% of, of the kind of success. Um, so equal even to, to being physically fit for a trip. And if I have a group of people in front of me at the start of a trip and, uh, you know, I get their experience forms and, and they've told me all their impressive, impressive kind of physical feats. Um, and, I, you know, I could order those uh, with how how fit I think uh, a person maybe is from from those forms, 
but that doesn't seem to represent actually who's necessarily successful on a trip um, and or who finds the trip um, kind of uh, very straightforward and, and is very relaxed on the trip and, and, and um, just cruises along uh, very happily. So, so yeah, and I, I think that's because what I can't see necessarily on a, or by looking at a person or by their forms is actually how physically tough they are. And um, I guess we have other names for that now. It might be resilience, for example, or it might be in the case of kind of a marathon running context, you know, that ability to go through the wall as such and, and, and keep on going. Uh, so next slide, please, Tom. Uh, and yeah, and the, the previous slide, I guess, was a nice sunny, sunny picture and beautiful mountains. Uh, but actually, a lot of the time expeditions look a bit like this. I chose to put my own picture up rather than um, of, of someone else. Uh, and yeah, and we, we're pretty tired. And it means that um, when that tiredness kicks in, we've got to be really self-motivated and mentally tough to to do the things that we need to do um, and that might be melt snow for water or make sure we eat that um, snack uh, and keep our energy levels up or it might be uh, helping putting the tents up or, or just keeping on going keeping on walking putting one foot in front of the other uh, yeah but how how do we train for that? I guess that's the question. There's lots of advice on how to train physically, but training that um, that mental toughness uh, ourselves, you know, how do we do that? Uh, and it does tie back to physical training. So, you know, when we're physically training and, um, and we're training really hard, then that can help our mental resilience and becoming tougher and getting used to feeling physically tired and keeping on going. But we need to do sort of long days out in the hills to replicate um, days on expedition. And I'd say even more than just one long day out in the hills, uh, or doing something that just require, it could be a really long road run or a really long bike. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the mountains if you don't have the mountain, the, they're not so accessible to you. But I would say on top of those individual kind of long, hard days is to try and do a few long, hard days back to back, because I think that's what most people um, struggle with a bit physically and mentally on expeditions, is that it's not just an isolated um, day. It is that continuous kind of um, physical uh, yeah, graft day after day. Um, and actually each individual day on expeditions, they're not, not usually super tough, but when they're put all together, then that's what makes, makes an expedition tough. So yeah, try and plan to do that then in your training. Um, not one hard day, but a few days back to back um, on the run up to an expedition. On top of that, I'd say there's other things that are less physically um, related, but can add up to being quite tough for people. Things like getting out your tent in the dark <laughs> um, uh, and the cold, obviously, on trips. So we often ha have to do this for our for our time starts and for our summit days. And it can be really alien to people, um, this getting up. Uh, yeah, in the cold and the dark. And I often get people go, oh, I can't possibly eat anything right now because it's a weird time in the morning and their bodies can't stomach anything. And, you know, you're really going to put yourself at a disadvantage if you're not functioning well um, doing that. And over the years, because I do it so regularly, um, must be 50 or times in the summer with all the alpine starts I did in the Alps this summer. Oh, the summer just gone. I, yeah, you just get into a routine and you get used to doing it and it's um, it becomes a lot easier with practice um, and you're mentally prepared for it. You know what, what it's going to feel like and you know you've got your little routine in the morning um, that you can you can go through quickly. 
So if you can replicate that at all, if you can go on a wild camp somewhere or or just a, yeah, a camp somewhere and um, get out your tent before dawn and, and go up a hill or or just for a walk, you know, try getting out your getting out your bed at um, pre-dawn, especially in the summer this time of year. It's really early. But, you know, and get on your and get on your road bike and go for a, a road cycle just as it's it's coming to dawn. To dawn the roads are lovely and quiet then usually so yeah practice that and and get into get into knowing what that feels like um yeah so you're not doing it for the first time on a summer day i would say with that clearly everyone's experience is different so you actually might have to do that for work anyway and maybe you, you therefore um that's a very familiar feeling already to you another thing um that people often find new and harder on expeditions is that um uh, camping and particularly camping in the snow which adds a whole new element of faff uh, so it totally depends on what sort of trip you're doing if you're going to go on kilimanjaro then you're, you're not going to be camping in the snow but you, you're going to be camping and you're going to have an alpine start as well for summer day but get used to if you can go out and do any sort of camping before an expedition then you and have a system in your tent and learn how to live comfortably in a tent and preferably if you can camp for a couple of nights in a row beforehand rather than just one night of survival and then um, and then back home yeah so so go out and experience that before you're going on an expedition and if you're going to a higher peak yeah preferably experience camping in the snow um trickier in the uk but still still possible uh, yeah so those sorts of things if you've had those sorts of experiences beforehand then you're going to have that massive advantage when you go on expedition you're going to have know the skills that are needed and you'll be mentally prepared for all of that experience with all of that with all of that experience yeah i suppose that's uh, just going into a bit more detail there becky about you know when we talk about being personally well organized or having your systems in place that's sort of what we mean isn't it it's having had that experience of um you know camping and knowing where all your stuff is in your tent you know compartmentalizing your different bits of gear and clothing so that when you get up at you know one or two in the morning in the dark you know you know where everything is and the the faff factor is um you know reduced to a minimum because there'll be a start time and you don't want to be the person you know at, at the back who's holding everybody else up yeah and ultimately that could 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 mean that you um you leave late and you miss kind of that critical time to to summit really so that would be a worst case scenario but you're also probably kind of rushing around when you don't want to be rushing around at altitude and um yeah the rest of your team members are getting cold because they're waiting and that sort of thing so yeah it's it's really important to to be organized on trips and um to be on yeah hit those it, there's deadlines basically and you need to be ready to go at certain times um without yeah. a doubt okay so are there any questions at all tom or are people um, let me just let me just check i think we're um, we're quiet on the questions at the moment but um yeah certainly if, if people want to post questions as we go along then uh, feel free to do so but we can yeah move on to the the next section i think becky cool well this is the third and final section before we go into kind of questions and answers at the end so a big part of expeditions i guess is kind of the having the knowledge and skills before you go but also sort of being uh knowing what's expected and the expectations of the trip as well so actually really getting into that before you go and 
thinking about it and how you can therefore prepare yourself is really useful. And a lot of people come on trips with completely different expectations to what the trip offers. And that can then, then they have to just adjust very quickly whilst they're, whilst they're on, a, on, on a trip. So, um, you know, they may, for example, have read that there's, there'll be camping such as on this trip in Nepal. Um, and here, uh, very common in Nepal to camp near a tea house. So we were actually using facilities as a tea house. But if we have the next slide, Tom. You know, the reality of, of camping at altitude is that also, you know, it's not always those nice sunny pictures that we we see that it is, you know, it is snowy and, and cold when when the sun is behind the mountains. So this is daytime still. You can see it's blue sky up there and uh, and that side of things. But the um, the shadow from the mountains come across. I think this is actually in the morning. So the sun hasn't quite risen high enough for us to get to get the sun on the tents tents yet. And this is on one of the the trekking trips um, that Jagged Globe offer. Uh, yeah, so having a think about that and understanding the reality of that, of how um, you're going to manage in a tent and kind of administer yourself and look after yourself. And the reality of that is that it might be longer periods of time in a tent or in a tea house. How are you going to entertain yourself? What what things you could take with you that actually means that you're going to be quite comfortable and happy? Uh, so that could be anything from games and entertainment to uh, stocking up on podcasts and um, and loading up kind of books you want to read on your on your Kindle as well, um, or games you can play with your your teammate. So the information is there, but it's kind of translating it from uh, you'll be camping to okay, well it might be. Um, longer time in a tent or sitting in a tea house than you would have expected actually and so how how you're going to um, cope with that um, and preparing for that beforehand. So uh, in combination with that um, you know having a look at the itinerary and, and sort of understanding that before you go in that sometimes for um, trips, they start um, actually at a relatively slow pace. So everyone's like geared up for this big physical challenge and ready to go. But you've got a long haul flight, then you've got, um, you know, maybe a, a, a night or two in a hotel before an internal flight uh, and then get going. So some trips have quite, a, you know, you're, you're straight into it straight away and, and some um, it feels a bit slower paced and if you've got all this pent up <laughs> I'm ready to go energy and um, and you haven't kind of realized that in the itinerary and prepared mentally for that it can be it can be a bit of a challenge for some people often um, going on a trip like that so thinking yeah reading the itinerary thinking about oh there's going to be actually a bit of time then you know how would I use that time um, or actually, I really need to make sure I get a good night's sleep then because we are up super early um, the next day, uh, for example. Uh, yeah, and thinking about that, the impact of that on you. And the second thing I was going to mention regarding this is the idea of a group trip as well. And um, therefore that you are going to be um, within a group uh, of people that actually on many, many trips I do, uh, there's either couples or people that have come up on their own solo and you're going to be meeting people and hanging out with them. So, so yeah, and there might be those long evenings. So having some, some games or something like that's really good to, to hang out with the, the group as well. OK, Tom, uh, the next slide, please. So also within your preparation, 
thinking about the culture that you're going to, these aren't kind of mountain playgrounds that we just turn up at. They are countries with history and cultures and um, and people with kind of unique history and language and that side of things. So thinking about and learning about the culture is of massive benefit before you go. It's fascinating, obviously, but uh, also increases understanding of, of where you're going and think about the impact on you as well. Uh, so that might be what uh, would be sensible to wear, for example, in towns or, or villages when you're in the more populated environments. And um, also thinking about the food, what food will you be eating? So this is dal bat, this is a kind of basic dal bat in Nepal. Um, you know, do you actually like that sort of food? Because if you're not going to like that sort of food on expedition, then thinking about actually how will I therefore make it um, possible that I can, can eat food and eat the meals and, you know, maybe ringing up Jagged Globe, for example, and saying, actually, I don't like rice and I'm going to Nepal. Is this going to be a problem? And giving them the heads up before, before you're going, um, for example. But if you haven't understood that before going and then serve the first meal <laughs> on a trip and uh, uh, and the leader or, or the company uh, doesn't doesn't know that that that's kind of going to be a problem with you for you on a on, on a trip then um, it's harder to to, to organize things not impossible often but a bit tricky so usually all trips start with a uh, all trips start with a kind of chats on things that are going to help you when you're on the trip for example how to stay healthy and going back to my 25 percent thing 25 percent fitness 25 percent um mental resilience and toughness and then 25 percent looking after yourself so we do put a lot of effort as expedition leaders into talking about health and hygiene and um if it's a high altitude trip then then looking after yourself at altitude. But there is a lot going on in those first few days on expedition and everything's all a bit overwhelming. Uh, that would be normal in your brain thinking about lots of different things. So it's quite a lot of information to take on and to implement. So the more you actually have knowledge you have before you go, you know, the better and the more kind of information will be able to sink in and you'll be able to actually um, use that information and act on it. So, for example, health and hygiene, actually, we've been hugely ed educated the last few months um, about hand washing and um, not touching our faces. And that that's really true on expedition, too, where we're not fighting uh, airborne um, bugs we're, we're fighting uh yeah stomach bugs um that is is hugely contracted from touching dirty stuff and then um and then it getting into our system so so yeah that can make a huge difference and the things that you need to do therefore to um yeah to stay healthy so and then thinking about actually what does that does that mean well you know, having a bar of soap in a soap dish and I take things like um, a, a nail brush so I can make sure I don't have any dirt underneath my nails and that side of things. Um, so preparing in that sense uh, helps you. So understanding and having the knowledge about health and hygiene and then what does that mean for a trip for you? So just got a... Yeah, go on, Tom. Sorry, Becky. Yeah, we just got a question on on mm. on the food, which um, I think uh, I may as well ask it now. I mean, somebody's yeah. asking about the sort of diet to follow before you actually go on the expedition. Uh, whether you've got any thoughts on that? Yeah. So um, I would say the most important thing is not getting sick before you go on expedition, and uh, being as healthy as possible so following a healthy diet um, 
uh, and that is a balanced diet with uh, your nutrition, carbohydrate and protein in. And I, I don't think um, I think we're sort of beyond the idea of fattening up or whatever for, for expeditions now. Um, uh, that used to be something that people did in the past, maybe. But yeah, being fit and healthy and therefore having a healthy diet overall. I'm sure there's people that really get into different sorts of um, um, carbon loading and, and protein based diets. But actually, you're going to have a slow start. You've got a long haul flight, for example, and you're going to have a slow start initially. So eating lots of carbohydrates the night before, it, it's not like a marathon. You know, you're going to be running the marathon, a marathon in, in six hours time. Uh, so that's um, not so important. Just being healthy. That's it. Don't get injured yeah, beforehand yeah. And, don't, <laughs> and don't get sick beforehand. And you, you've got that long haul flight that. Uh, you know, in normal times, we pick up bugs anyway, don't we? So, so yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, it, it's easy to get run down, isn't it, in general, because you're rushing stuff and you're trying to squeeze lots of stuff in before a trip. So um, try and avoid that. Sure. Uh, altitude. So along with not getting stomach bugs on expedition, if you've got an altitude trip, then, um, yeah. So educating yourself on, on, on looking after yourself at altitude. And you could get into that. I find it fascinating, the physiological side of it. But the most important thing to, to be looking at is how do I not get altitude sickness? And understanding the things that you can do yourself not to get um, sick at altitude. So Jagged Global do their bit with having a good itinerary that has a steady uh, ascent profile and then um, all the members on the on participants on the expedition we all need to um, really yeah look after ourselves take everything slowly um, and allow our bodies to acclimatize uh, appropriately I think there's some temptation sometimes on rest days to to want to do actually a really hard hike on a rest day. Um, I'm a great believer in doing some form of act, gentle activity on a rest day. But um, yeah, in our rushed and busy lives, uh, it can feel, sometimes people don't feel like it's right to, to, to relax <laughs> on, a, on a trip like that. But you do, you do need to take those re the rest when it's, when it's in the itinerary. Um, or, Gentle, gentle, active rest, I like to call it. OK, so moving on to um, a bit about skills. And if you imagine if you go on a trip and it's to a new altitude, new place, new culture, um, and then also you're learning new skills and you're not familiar with your kit, and that's all new as well. It's an extremely steep learning curve and you're not kind of tipping the balance in your favour for, um, for success on a trip, really. You know, people do manage and people do cope, but uh, it's going to be a lot harder work. So if you can get to know the skills in, um, in an environment that's maybe a bit similar, but minus the altitude, for example, like going up to Scotland. So we have the next slide, please. Um, so like going up to Scotland and you can learn how to use crampons and ice axe and start to move about on a bit steeper ground, then, um, and get familiar with that terrain, then you're going to be, a, yeah, um, really a lot better advantages than, than learning that whilst coping with the altitude, whilst all the other new stuff that you're learning, whilst camping in the snow, for example. Yeah, so I think that's really important. And I've put some pictures up from Scotland because, uh, yeah, I spend my, my winter up in Scotland. But whether that's the Alps uh, or whether that's up in Scotland, um, yeah, that's uh, really, really important to do. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, 
a few weeks ago for Robert Anderson's uh, talk about climbing Everest. And I think somebody asked, you know, what's the most important thing to focus on? And he just said crampon technique. Now, you know, plenty of days out, you know, winter mountaineering in, in Scotland or in the Alps, um, you know, with your, with your crampons on, it, it all adds up to, you know, moving more efficiently and, um, you know, yeah, therefore you're use, using less energy once you're on the, the big mountains. Yeah, definitely. I think there, there's a big thing about this efficiency thing and, uh, yeah, familiarity with um, with the terrain and moving over that terrain will massively help with efficiency. And it's about those um, those marginal gains uh, uh, that stack everything in your in your in your favour, really. Um, yeah. So great, great to get out in different places and, and learn learn skills um, to improve. And it feeds back into this is also physical preparation. I don't think there's there's more physical work that I do than in in Scotland in winter, and and it's it's mental toughness as well and resilience. You know some of the conditions we go out to. I've put two actually very sunny pictures of Scotland up, up there, but some of the conditions we go out in Scotland are actually um, really tough, and people have to be organised with their kit uh, and have to learn those skills, and. Um, and, and yeah, and have to learn mental resilience because there's a storm blowing <laughs> in their face and uh, it, it can yeah, be... Yeah, there, uh, there was a day, a day when I was out on the bend on the same day as you this past winter where, you know, it was just uh, blowing all day. It was really, you know, really sort of stormy weather and yeah, just to uh, look after yourself in that environment, never mind do the actual climbing is, uh, is pretty challenging. Mm. Yeah, that's often the case in Scotland. I mean, it's why we always recommend it as such a great training ground. Because yeah, in terms of yeah, like you say, being resilient, you absolutely need to be to um, to to cope with that environment. Otherwise, you'd just stay in the hotel. Yeah, yeah, and um, I'd say it's it can be quite intimidating when there's spin drift pouring down the. <laughs> The face and that sort of thing and it's getting into but you know people haven't got their hoods up and it's gone into the back of the neck and that sort of thing and if you can get uh, into a place where you feel actually that a you've got the skills and b you've been in that environment before you can feel actually very comfortable um, then and you can be thinking you'll have the the spare mental capacity to be thinking about other things rather than like oh my god this is really wild is this <laughs> you know um and i i've just dropped a glove or something essential like that <laughs> yeah and and even though yes the weather can be incredibly wild in scotland you, you know you're still not that far away from the valley so if you then go to a, an expedition context and you might be a you know camp two um and and there's a storm then absolutely that experience in scotland will stand you in good stead because it's going to feel a lot more intimidating being up a, halfway up a himalayan peak experiencing those weather conditions you know compared to you know um down at sea level in in scotland yeah definitely it's about this i guess sometimes we talk about an apprenticeship really don't we and building that foundation gradually so you're in wild weather but you're not at, in Scotland but you're not at altitude and you're not uh, that remote and then you've got that sort of foundation there to build upon and then you can add a bit of altitude in there or more remote and rather than putting all those elements together which um, is is very full-on for people otherwise and and maybe you know I've seen perfectly fit and capable people um, it was in a storm on Aconcagua, actually. Um, and and yeah, and they, they were just like, this is, I don't want to be here. And um, and and they headed down, uh, even though he he was very physically capable of, of achieving the summit. But he just didn't have um, those skills and that experience to, yeah, to, to want to be there anymore. Um, so, and I think he fully recognised that at the end of the trip when we, we were chatting, yeah. 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 Okay. 
I think I've got the right slide. There we are. So yes, yeah. so questions. Um, so yeah, so that that that's great, Becky. I think um, you've obviously covered quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of detail there. We've we've got a few questions here. Uh, one from Carol. She's saying uh, really interesting and useful. What would you recommend as an entry level expedition? I've done a lot of trekking, but mainly not camping. Oh, um, well, something in Nepal, which where you're camping and, and actually using tea house facilities as well often, that's quite a nice one to do because you've got, um, so the three peaks, three passes, which I put some photos up of, um, we, were, we were camping each evening, but the majority of the time we were staying uh, camping in the grounds of the tea houses. And so actually we were using the tea house dining rooms to um, just enjoy sitting around and uh, as a group and having dinner in there, um, sometimes in our dining tent, sometimes in there. And um, yeah, so that that's a nice, nice combination. Are there any that come to mind for yourself, Tom? Yeah, I think, um, you know, in the Kumbu and and uh, I mean, I'm thinking of Mira Peak because now there are tea houses up to Kare. So again, whilst we're camping, because obviously we need the tents on the mountain, um, you know, we do have the luxury, if you like, of s sitting in the um, in the tea house dining rooms in the evenings. So the food might be coming out of our own kitchen, our own cook staff are preparing that. Um, so yeah, it gives you a bit of respite and a bit of extra comfort. And then obviously, when you're on the mountain itself, you know you're going to be well on Mirror Peak, sort of camping normally off the side of the glacier or on rock shelves at base camp, and then again at high camp, maybe on rock, maybe on snow. Um, but Mirror Peaks, uh, you know, six thousand four seven six meters. It's a big mountain, uh, but it is a good introductory expedition I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even Kilimanjaro, even though it's so it's it's completely camping based, they're so well organized there, aren't they, with um with the dining tents uh, and the like that actually it's um yeah it's so well set up that it, it's really comfortable camping in the grand scheme of things as well. So so yeah, that sort of trip is great. Mm -hmm. I mean, with Kilimanjaro, it's, it's just a short trip. It's um, you know, it, even if you're not really enjoying it, it's not. A, it doesn't go on for for that long. So in in that sense, <laughs> I think um, yeah, it's it's a good, it's a good trip to sort of uh, if you've not done much camping to 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 experience that for the first time. The one thing I would say with Kilimanjaro is, you know, we talk about cum cumulative days that. One of the issues with with Kilimanjaro is that actually the days leading up to the summit day, none of them are really that that difficult. Um, so I think summit day just for feel particularly tough because it's so much harder than the day. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, that's a it's a big day compared to yeah the the, the prior ones on the trip. OK, so a um, couple of other questions. Somebody's asked here, any differences in preparation for South American expeditions? Um, I I can't think of anything I would do differently compared on a South American trip to before a, a Himalayan trip, personally. Uh, apart from, you know, just understanding the culture, it's um, and, and that sort of kind of delving into a bit of that side of things um, in my research. But otherwise, physically and mentally, kind of more depends on what the trip's going to involve, whether it's an Aconcagua trip or a, or a trekking trip in Colombia or something like that. Sure, OK, so we've got another question here from John. Great lecture, thanks, Becky. My question is that I've summited Mira, but felt a bit wobbly, knackered, and I felt I couldn't push on beyond that. But I have aspirations of Aconcagua or Peak Lenin. Should I find another 6,000 to 6,500 metre peak to feel more comfy, or would it be OK to jump into the higher climbs? Um, 
So it, it's difficult to say why why did you feel wobbly on that that particular particular day? Um, and I would say you would you would just gain more experience if you did a six thousand meter beforehand. You'd understand more about yourself and therefore how you need to prepare for something bigger. So I would you know, it's about building that foundation of experience again. And if you've got more or lower down experience wise, then you're going to have a broader foundation and, and more experience to draw on when you go to something higher. That means that you'll have a better chance of success. Um, and the, the thing is, it's actually um, really enjoyable to gain more experience and go to a different place. So, so yeah, you know, maybe look at a, a different area or a, a, yeah, different mountain range rather than going back to Nepal and, and see, yeah, get to see something different and then move on to Aconcagua or Peak Lennon. I would say Peak Lennon is probably a step up from Aconcagua, even though there's not much difference in altitude. And that's because Aconcagua, you are mainly not on snow um, and not camping on snow rather than Peat Lennon is a lot snowier. Aconcagua is quite a dry, arid mountain um, in, in comparison. So those, um, so you won't, you could use, some, some years people walk to the summit of Aconcagua without using crampons and ice axe. We certainly did need crampons and ice axe when we were out there. But on Peak Lennon, you will 100% need, need those skills. And it's a big summit day on Peak Lennon as well. Um, so if you were going to pick one of those, I'd go for the Aconcagua um, first off um, before jumping into to Peak Lennon. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Aconcagua is, um, you know, obviously it's not a technical climb up the Horcones route, but uh, yeah, it, it's certainly a very big mountain and it's, you know, it's got a thousand meter summit day. And even though it's dry, um, you know, it can be very, very windy um, and very, very cold, uh, <laughs> as well as very hot, low down. And uh, there's a lot, lot to learn on Aconcagua. Um, yeah. It's, it's usually the fair, both Aconcagua and Peak Lennon are, are, are mountains where you are load carrying and doing rotations and often Aconcagua is the first time people have done that and um, so it's a, a steep learning curve for, for people coping with with um, with that side of things and, and that's why it's such a, a step up from, from Mirror Peak really. Um, because you've got kind of more cumulative days um, for that side of things. So, so yeah, I would always, I would always go for the, the more experience and then better chance of success later on. So another 6,000 meter peak. But if not, yeah. have a have a crack at Aconcagua and you know the mountain's always there. So, so I people go back and have a have a second go at it often and are successful on their second go because they've learned so much from their first go. Okay, well, let's move on quickly because we are um, sort of coming up to an hour. Um, so we've got a few more questions. Tony's asking, hi, great talk, thanks. I'm going down to Elbrus in 2022. I know that the summit days is a long one. What sort of time do they normally start? Uh, well, I think Tony, have you, have you been to Elbrus? Yeah, yeah, we did a yeah. summit when we went, but um, we had very poor weather, but so I'd like to go back. <laughs> and what, um, so did you actually set off in the... Or, yeah, or? we set off, so I can't remember whether it was midnight think, or 2 a.m. I think it's, yeah, it's yeah, 1 or 2 a.m. typically. It's 1,600 vertical metres of ascent, isn't it, or something crazy See? from the, yeah, from the yeah. north side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, uh, what are your thoughts? This is from Lizzie. What are your thoughts on the services offered by people like the Altitude Centre? Do you think it helps? Do I think? Oh, well, this is a big question in mountaineering right now. And um, 
And actually, I'm a scientist, so I've, I've come from a science background. And, and my thoughts are there aren't there is enough science out there yet to say either way. Um, but they're very happy to take your money, as you'd imagine a company to be. So I think with pre-acclimatisation, there's actually a huge amount of uh, products on the market, some of which actually have no benefits whatsoever. Uh, and I think that's pretty proven, actually. And then some other things that, to be honest, at the moment, you're probably being a guinea pig for science using. So um, personally, I would save your money and um, and and just, you know, rely on the fact that the itineraries have put, been put together for a steady acclimatisation pro, or, or ascent profile. Um, and actually, there's also a bit of a, a psychological impact potentially of having done some pre acclimatization thinking that you're a bit invincible from altitude and finding out that um, you're probably not. <laughs> and you need to still be um, really thinking about looking after yourself so you can allow your body to acclimatize once you're um out in the Himalayas or, or the Andes or, or whatever part of the world you're in. Right. Um so quite a specific question here from Fonna. He's saying great talk and really informative. I'm an instructor and expedition leader and have ideas and ambitions for climbing in the stands. What mm -hmm. advice uh would you give for climbing in that region? Thanks. Okay, so um yeah, it's a fantastic part of the world. And um, yeah, I probably spent about six months out there doing various bits. Um, <laughs> I've just finished a talk actually that I did last week on on, on the Central Asia. So um, uh, that I spent two hours talking about it. Uh, yeah, I, I'd say the main places are that have high mountains are Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan and the um a tiny bit of of uh kazakhstan as well and the easiest place to go and climb in is kyrgyzstan because it's actually really encouraging people to go with no it's abolished the tourist visa um fees and that sort of thing and um it, it is is very accessible to go to and it has peak lenin which is a yeah a jagged globe trip so seven thousand meter peaks such as that it's got three seven thousand meter peaks actually and then it also has much um yeah whole range lots of five and six thousand meter peaks as well and lots of great trekking so you it really has everything so i'd look into look into kyrgyzstan it's one of my one of my favorite places in the world actually <laughs> okay great right. right we're just going to quickly just uh, the the final question here is from lane this is probably one that i'm <laughs> best place to answer uh, might be too early to say but any views on whether expeditions planned for later this year will be happening well that is the million dollar question <laughs> lane all i could say uh, in reply to that, it's certainly, you know, we're, we're planning and hoping that we'll be running trips later um, in the year if we are able to. Um, OK, so I think we'll have to wrap it up there, Becky. So um, thanks for that. I'm sure our audience, you know, will have found that really useful. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I took away from that is, you know, appreciating that you go on an expedition. It's not just a mountaineering playground and to learn about the future really uh, help people. Thank you very much. Okay, no problem, okay. thank you. All right, thanks. Right then. So um I just uh just like to quickly mention um that we still got our GoFundMe support the Sherpas campaign. We're about £2,000 short of our target of £8,848. So if you're able to donate to that to assist our Sherpas who and the all of our staff in Nepal who are unable to climb um, to work on the climbing and trekking trips this spring, then uh, we'd really appreciate that. This week we're sending $10,000 over to Nepal, which is uh, money that people have donated so um that's that's fantastic and we really appreciate your support 
So that's it, folks. Thanks again, and we look forward to um, talking to talking you, to you about some more adventures um, about the mountains and wild places. And as I say, it will be a, a polar themed discussion next week with Helen Turton. Uh, uh, thanks for Becky Coles. That was great, and we'll we'll see you again.